Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're starting a series this for the next six weeks, and it's entitled, Tell Me the Stories of Jesus, the Kingdom Parables. And so I feel like it's important for us to study those. When we think about parables, it's one of the most remarkable and important and memorable teachings that Jesus used. And then what was the topic that Jesus most taught about? and most talked about. It was the kingdom of God. And so in order for us to become mature disciples, we've got to really reflect on what the kingdom of God is. What is the kingdom of God? And I would say anywhere where God through Jesus Christ is in authority, that's when we have the kingdom of God present. When God's rule is reigning and resting and there's justice and there's love and there's peace. And so when Jesus was here on earth and Jesus brought about miracles and brought about healing and, and brought about the truth, then we had the kingdom of God on earth. Of course, we know Jesus ascended into heaven, but then Jesus said, listen, through the Holy Spirit, I will give you that ability to bring about the love and the healing and the justice yourselves. And so we're a part of that kingdom of God here on earth. And then, of course, when Jesus returns, the kingdom of God will be fulfilled at his return. So it's so important to study the kingdom and to study parables so that we can be can practice the precepts of the kingdom and mature and become transformed so that we can transform the world. Jesus said in his first sermon in Luke 4, let me read it so I get it exactly right. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news. And so we can preach the good news even whether you're behind a pulpit or not. He said he's The kingdom of God is among us. Mass Chapel, United Methodist Church. We got the kingdom of God. We've got that ability, that authority through the Holy Spirit to bring about the change here on earth. And so I want you to just ponder this icebreaker before we pray. Have you ever heard or listened to a story that really moved you emotionally? Maybe, a, maybe it was a story that brought tears to your eyes. Maybe it made you furious. Maybe it made you a little sad. Think for a moment on that kind of story and hold it, lean into it. Just a few seconds. Would anybody like to reflect on any type of story that you've heard or experienced that has moved you really deeply? There's a, something about reading my books that I used to read. Uh, it was a story about, a, it was a jazz in the series. It was a story about a woman who Sue stepped out and was trying to get this preacher. She wanted to be married to a preacher. She ended up with a son, with the preacher's son, and they had a little girl together. She was cheating. Mm -hmm. And the little girl got, got kidnapped and got raped. And she had tried to get back to the father to tell him, to let him know he had a child and the child had got raped. Mm -hmm. And when she found the little girl, the father found the little girl, the little girl was just like down the street from where the mother lived and the man had cut all the little girl's hair off. Yeah, a story like that. It really affects you. It really moves you. Mm -hmm. And many of 
of us have stories. And it's fiction or nonfiction, there are stories of that type that really move us. And that's what a parable does. A parable was meant to move us. A parable was meant for us to lean into it and to really feel it. It's not just a regular story. But it's a story that Jesus told, stories that Jesus told, parables that Jesus told to shock the audience, to make the audience think, sometimes to make the audience uncomfortable, to make the audience cry. That was what a parable was. So we're going to talk about parables, define what a parable is, talk about why Jesus taught in parables. And then we're going to explore, within the next six weeks, we're going to explore his six most popular ones. And today we're going to talk about the parable of the Good Samaritan. So you can go ahead and turn to Luke 10. Before we get started. Luke 10. It's at 15. It is. Yeah. Uh -oh. <laughs> Thank you. The Good Samaritan? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. It is 10. Okay. Oh, you want to use it? Oh, I can. Yeah, there's 10. Oh, yeah, starting with verse 25. Well, yeah. We're not there yet, but I just wanted you to be prepared. So we want to apply these truths as we explore what a parable is and talk about the parable of the Good Samaritan. We want to, as we explore what it is, we then also want to apply the concepts and the precepts to our lives. And so let us pray. Oh God, you sent your beloved son into this world as the incarnate and holy Lord, and you brought your heavenly kingdom to earth for us. Show us, God, through your word and through the study how to listen to and understand Jesus' teaching as his methods are explained and kingdom truths are shared. Help us to meditate and let them resonate within our spirit and our hearts and our souls. Let them move us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, I got a handout. Not sure I have enough, but you all can share. You love each other. <laughs> of a parable is on the handout, but before you really look at it and start reading it, can anybody give me your definition of a parable? And don't Google it. <laughs> <laughs> I think of it as a story that's told to teach a lesson, to teach something. Yeah, A story that's told to teach a lesson. That's great. That's absolutely true. When we look at our handout, it says it comes from the Greek word parabole, and it means to throw alongside, meaning you're telling something that's abstract, and then you're throwing alongside something that's concrete. We're trying to explain something spiritual, and you're putting something literal or something easier to understand besides something spiritual so that those understandings come to be and we can and we can oh gosh perceive a bit more clearly it gives a connection with everyday reality a parable is also an extended metaphor an extended simile and i go on to tell on your handout it lets you know what a simile is it, it, it's a comparison. It usually uses words like as and like. So we've got some examples here. Solid as a rock. rock. Light as a feather. Mm -hmm. Strong as an uh -oh. uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's a simile. It has like or and in it. And then a metaphor. A metaphor is a figure of speech 
that's applied to something that's not literal, using something known to explain something that's unknown. So a metaphor uh, like Jesus, Jesus is a rock. Jesus is a rock. Not Jesus is like a rock, but Jesus is a rock. Y'all know that song in a weary, weary land, in a weary land, shelter in the times of storm. And so what is Jesus? We don't have vocabulary to talk about who Jesus is. We're not smart enough. We're not wise enough. We've got a God that's beyond words. And so we use things like similes and metaphors so that we can, if you are, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, you are the, um, looking on the handout, if we filled in the blank, you are the what of the earth? Salt. Salt. Very good. You are the blank of the world. Light. Light. light of the world. Not as light or like a light, but you are. You are. So we're trying to explain who Jesus is. So why is this symbolic language needed? And just you don't have to turn to Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, but Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 basically says his God's ways are not our ways. God's faults are not our faults. So once again, God is so vast and so wide and the breath of God can't be conceived. So we need similes and metaphors and parables and anything we can use to understand the concepts of God. Now, why did Jesus teach in parables? Why didn't he just speak clearly? So you know what, I told you to turn to Luke, but let me get you to turn to Matthew 13. It's here on the handout. Matthew 13, beginning at verse 10. Matthew 13. All right, anybody got it yet? Volunteer to read this morning. How much? How much? Oh, uh, let's see. Verse 10 through 17. Okay. Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 through 13? Uh, 10 through 17. Beginning at verse 10. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has, whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Those, seek, yeah, those seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has been, has become cal, <laughs> sorry, calcified, callous. <laughs> they hardly hear with their ears. They have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Verse 16. But blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. And this is the NIV version. All right. So that's an interesting passage of scripture as to why Jesus taught in parables. And when we look at it, it almost, it seems as if Jesus is purposely hiding the meaning of his stories to a certain group of people. And he talks about a passage in Isaiah, and it's Isaiah 6, verses 8 and 9. And Isaiah has been called to prophesy to the people. And God comes to Isaiah and, and tells Isaiah even then. Um, it's the passage where Isaiah says, where God says, who will go for me? And, and Isaiah says, send me. 
And, you know, Isaiah is all excited. Send me, send me, Lord, I'll go. And then in the passage of scripture, God tells Isaiah, listen, you're going to talk. You're going to talk and they're not going to hear. They're not going to perceive. And it's because their hearts were hardened. Their hearts were closed to the words and the meaning of God. And so here, when Jesus talks about why he's teaching in parables, the people's hearts were hardened once more. And so it wasn't as if he was purposely excluding, but he knew they just wanted to fight. They weren't there to try to learn and understand, but they wanted to confront Jesus. They really wanted to kill Jesus, as, as we know in, in various other scriptures. And Jesus knew it wasn't his time. He had, he had ministry to fulfill. His earthly ministry had not been fulfilled. And so to those whose hearts were open, the parables would have been understood. And they would have been vibrant and exciting and caused people to change their lives. But to those who were ignorant and whose hearts were closed, the parables' meaning would have been concealed. And so parables reveal and conceal. But there's a reason why Jesus wasn't doing it purposely to leave people out. And then I also love the fact where he says, to those who have, more will be given. That, that's why that's explained. The, when we want, Jesus gives us more. But when we push Jesus away, Jesus says, okay, I'll take what you've got and I'll give it to someone else. All right, watch. Okay, Siri. <laughs> Maybe Siri won't say no for that in Bible study. Okay. Last, very last line on this handout. Parable characteristics. There's a setting. There's anonymity. There's a plot. There's a story. Uh, there's a movement. And then there's instruction. Then there's Jesus' instruction. So now we've talked about the parable. So now let's get into the Good Samaritan. I've got another handout. So you. All right, let's read. Let's keep moving on as, as we get, in, get into the movement of the text. Verses 33 through 35. I get someone to read that. So the Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, poured oil on him. Then he put the man on his own dime, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Next day he took out two denarius and gave them to the man Look out now, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for all any extra expenses you may have. Oh, absolutely. So now we have the turning point. So stories in these days were told in a series of threes. And so they would have been expecting a third character getting to be introduced. But the expectation would have been here comes an Israelite is going to come and save the day. But now he shocks this audience by introducing a Samaritan. Does anyone know, have any idea why a Samaritan would have been such a shocking input to this story? Yeah, because yes. my, my, uh, the NLT translation says he was a despised mm -hmm. Samaritan. And the, the Samaritans were mixed people. Yes. And so the Jewish people looked down upon them because they were this, uh, people whose parents had uh, intermarried with other groups that right. were not Jews. And so the Jewish people looked down. Mm -hmm. When the Assyrians overtook the northern kingdom, the Assyrians came over to the northern kingdom, and so we had a group of Israelites that intermarried with the enemy, and they were considered, what, what was that word you used? Was five the less than less than they discriminate against them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So there's this ongoing feud between Jews and Samaritans, and here Jesus comes and introduces a Samaritan as the hero. So what exactly? Go back to verses thirty-three 
33 and 35. How? Let's go with that and see. What did the Samaritan do to help the man? He had compassion on him. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And compassion, bandaged his wounds. What else did he do? He uh, mm -hmm. took him to the to the innkeeper and uh, told them to take care of him. Mm -hmm. And he uh, paid him for that. And he said he would come back and he uh, owed anything else he would pay it. Yeah. So he showed he was honest. This despised man who supposedly was no good and less than showed me, you know, he gave money in advance to show what an upstanding individual he really was. So Jesus turns upside down what the Jews and what this lawyer would have been thinking as to the boundaries that would have been set when he said, you know, love your Love your neighbor as yourself. These are these are boundaries. You know who's your neighbor. He had an idea of who the neighbor was because you were obligated to treat a fellow Jew as a neighbor. But a Samaritan? No, absolutely not. So Jesus once again countercultural turns culture on its head. This parable shocks us. Would have shocked them. I mean, to no end. Would have shocked them. Because their community was destroyed. Their community, Jesus gave a different definition of community. And I love what Carolyn said, and Kathy Barton touched on it. Compassion. Compassion. That's the meaning. So now let's read the last two verses, 36 and 37. Oh, well. I think I read this. No, I didn't. So maybe, yeah, so if I can get someone to read 36 and 37. Let me 35 read 37. I'll read 35. Okay, 36 and 37. Thank okay, you. I'll do 36 and 37. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Verse 37. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bam, Mark the Rock. Who <laughs> would be the name, the man? This is, and this is the instruction part of the parable where Jesus is giving instruction. Very often there's an audience response. We really don't have an audience response at the end of this parable. It's, you know, we've got to be flexible. All parables don't have all the characteristics, but most of them do. But Jesus' instruction, who was the real neighbor? The Samaritan. So having read this parable once again a little slower than we typically do, because this one we're really familiar with, how do we gain, what's one way to gain eternal life if we look at this parable? How do we bring the kingdom of God here on earth? What do we do? Uh, love your neighbor Neighbors. as yourself. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And who is your neighbor? People you come in contact with daily. Yeah. Sometimes even when we think we're being hospitable and giving and just, like this Lucille was just talking about, we step over people, we don't want to go out. I don't know if you've ever, I'm thinking in my mind there's a story, it's, it may be true or untrue, of a preacher, a pastor of a large church who dressed himself up in homeless clothes, up to the homeless and laid himself outside the steps and his parishioners all stepped over him and, and talked about him, kicked him to the side because they were ready to go to church and then he comes and reveals himself, mm -hmm. reveals himself. When you looked over me, you I looked over Jesus. Yeah, I looked at a movie last week where this preacher was in the church and his hair, his hair, he was trying to be himself. Mm -hmm. His hair was just all over his head, flexed, it going everywhere. He was in this big church. Mm -hmm. and the church just did not like his message. Mm -hmm. And they put him out. 
And this man, when he said, he just felt like God didn't need him inside the church. He needed him outside the walls. This man went outside the walls and started preaching. He, the church had this shelter. He went to this shelter, started preaching at this shelter. It had more people in the shelter than did in the church. Mm -hmm. He Absolutely. said, that's where God made him. He just couldn't get it into himself, being in that pulpit, preaching to the dead. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's right. And they weren't receptive and he couldn't be himself. Isn't it interesting how we all have a different way to give our testimony and to give our word and you're not going to be me and I'm not going to be you, but we all have something, something to share and something to give. Jesus gives us the keys, one of the key keys to the kingdom, as Carolyn has just said, your neighbor, who is your name? Yeah. Those that are marginalized and left out and lost and the homeless among us. And we talk all the time, should I give money? Should I not? What are they going to do with it? Yeah, what? Pastor, made me think about the last two words, to the, the last two verses, the last two lines in the song, coming home, open wide with your arms of love, because Lord, I'm coming home. Because that's what this parable reminds me of. Our, our, our arms shouldn't be so close that they only hug our family and the folks we already know. But we should open them wide because God has given us neighbors that we don't even recognize. We don't know. Mm -hmm. That we don't even recognize. Amen. And sometimes God is exposing us and, and introducing us to people and we, we're not even aware of it. But God does that and gives us the gift. We, we want to lead someone to Christ and sometimes we have that opportunity and we look totally look over it because we missed the gift. We missed the gift. We missed the gift that God has given. Pastor, that brings me to a, a story where I think about this lady that she lived several houses up from me. And when they ran out of masks, at COVID, when COVID came about, she made up these masks, calls me on the telephone and says, I know you know people that need some masks. And she brings them to my house. And leaves them out by my mailbox. Well, this lady made over a thousand masks for me to give out to people. So what I would do, I put them in baggies and put them in my neighbor's mailboxes and say, this is from her. I didn't never say it was from me. It was from her that was sharing it with all of you that don't have masks. Yes. And, you know, it was interesting. I didn't know this lady that well. You know, you pass by... This lady brings me cookies. She makes me bread. <laughs> she calls me all the time. And she'll say, see, your, your mailbox go in it. It'll be a loaf of bread in my mailbox. She's made for me. I know. <laughs> behind their garage and their garage door openers and so as we prepare to close this afternoon, I want you to just take a few moments of silence and just ask yourself, are there any people you could minister to? Think of someone you can pray about or pray for today. Make a mental list of someone you can help or some group that's typically been discriminated against and maybe you can do something. We can all do something. Just take a few moments of silence and reflect on what we can do to live out this parable and show compassion. And if anyone would like to share, just a couple of folks like to share what anything you could do.
First of all, get, not get myself right before I diminish that up here. Because it's, it's got to start with me first. Mm -hmm. Got to start with you first. Amen. And then go out and minister. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, let us conclude with prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for how you have revealed your kingdom principles this day. Give us hearts of love and compassion. Help us to really, really, truly love you and love our neighbors as ourselves. Convict us when we fall and help us to put feet to our ears and action to our love. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you and go in peace.